Okay, so it's time for our next talk. Our presenter is a production engineer at Facebook who's going to be telling us about what coroutines are anyway. Please welcome John Rees. Hi, folks. Um, so I work alongside Lisa, who you all met yesterday morning as a member of our internal Python Foundation team. We tend to focus on building tools and infrastructure for Python at Facebook. And there's a lot of things that I tend to dig in that aren't necessarily uh, interesting to everybody, but that you know uh, is interesting to me, and I like to find things out. So 10 years ago, I got a software engineering degree from a school that was way too expensive in a part of upstate New York that was way too cold and had way too much snow. So naturally, I like to ask questions like, why did I go here, and how much do I owe? So one reason I love Python is how easy it is to answer questions about how things work and why they work. Now, coroutines are the foundation for asynchronous programming in Python and a fundamental building block of the async I.O. framework. But there can be a lot of mystery around them. What is a coroutine? How do they work? Why are they so important? I'm going to go ahead and spoil the answer here a bit and see what the source of all truth and knowledge on the internet has to say. Coroutines are computer program components that generalize subroutines for non-preemptive multitasking by allowing execution to be suspended and resumed. Now, for the robots in the audience, that's an excellent answer. <laughs> for the rest of us, this is quite impenetrable. So let's try to break this down into something that a human can actually understand. Coroutines are a variant of functions that enables concurrency via cooperative multitasking. I want to explore the genesis of coroutines and understand how they work and why we use them. There are a lot of important concepts to cover, so I'm going to focus on the core ideas, and then uh, what the why that drives them, and how they relate to Python. So let's start from the beginning. What is a function? I'll spare you the one true definition this time, because we're all humans here today, except maybe that skull bot from yesterday. Uh, either way, the function, I'm sorry, a function is a sequence of instructions that takes inputs and returns outputs. In pretty much any useful programming language, functions are a fundamental building block. They let you organize your code into reusable components that take inputs, do something with them, and yield outputs. When we execute the main function, the runtime steps through each statement. Oops. When it gets to a function call, the runtime pauses the current function's execution sends the inputs to the function being called, executes the body of that function, then sends the outputs back to the caller, and resumes execution of the original function where it left off. Now, this seems reasonably straightforward, but there's a lot of details here that we take for granted. We can go deeper. Now, James stole a bit of my thunder yesterday, but hang in there. So as you may know, CPython uses a virtual machine to execute our programs, and it provides an amazing utility to peer under the covers. The dis module, for short for disassemble, can give us a human-readable listing of the compiled bytecode for each function. This bytecode is the exact instructions used by the virtual machine, or the runtime, to execute our Python code. This is the output we get when disassembling the square and main functions from before. It looks more complicated this way, but if we keep asking questions and digging deeper, it'll all start to make sense. We just need to understand the context of how the runtime works. As you might also know, the CPython runtime uses a stack-based virtual machine to execute instructions. There are no registers like you might see or use in assembly programming. If an instruction needs, an, needs to operate on some piece of data, that data must be first put onto the stack. The stack itself is just a linear block of memory that contains data or references to data. The runtime uses what's called a stack pointer to keep track of where the top of the stack is. When executing instructions, it's possible to push data onto the top of the stack. The load fast instruction, for example, has one job, push a single value onto the stack. Each time this happens, the stack pointer is incremented to point at the new top of the stack. Other instructions can then consume or pop items from the stack and even push new items on at the same time. For example, a math operation like multiplication would pop the two top items from the stack which resets the stack pointer each time. Then it performs the calculation and finally pushes the resulting value back onto the stack to be used by future instructions. But not everything lives solely on the stack. 
data that outlasts the function creating it has to be stored somewhere else so that it doesn't go away when the function returns. So like most languages, Python uses the heap to store objects in long-term memory. Unlike the stack, this is just an unordered space where objects can be allocated and deallocated at any time during execution. And many times, items on the stack are just references to the real objects on the heap. But again, the exact details here of this relationship is less important than knowing it exists. So if we go back to our disassembled instructions from earlier, we can start to piece together what happens when we execute the main function. Each line represents a single instruction for the CPython virtual machine. It's akin to assembly code instructions, but designed for an idealized but fake CPU architecture. If we look at an individual instruction, there are four pieces of information here. The line number of the original code that a group of instructions represents, the instruction address relative to the top of the function, class, or module, depending on what was disassembled, the op code, which is the specific virtual machine operation that should be executed, and lastly, a numerical parameter for the operation, often either a raw value or an index into some data set, like the list of global or local variables. The value in parentheses is just to let us humans know what that parameter represents. So if we compare this back with our original source code, we can start to see how it all relates to the functionality. These instructions perform the multiplication and return the result. These instructions call the square function and store the result in x. These print the value stored in x. And finally, these last two instructions represent the implicit return statement. Now, when executing the code, the runtime needs to keep track of its position in the set of instructions. Each instruction is predetermined fixed size in memory and therefore has its own memory address. So the runtime will just keep track of the memory address of the next instruction that it has to execute. This is called the instruction pointer. Each time the runtime executes an instruction, it automatically increments the instruction pointer. Special instructions can then modify the instruction pointer, allowing the runtime to jump between different sections of code. This is the basis of all flow control, including if-else conditional blocks, for and while loops, and function calls. So now let's bring back the stack from earlier and take a high-level conceptual look at how this could be executed by the runtime. First, we'll push a reference to the square function that we want to call, which is in the global scope. And after each operation, we'll increment the instruction pointer. Then we'll load the constant value for the parameter that we're passing to our square function. Now we can run the operation to actually call the function. The parameter to this instruction is the number of arguments that we're passing. So that the, op the call function operation knows to consume that number of items from the stack before it finds the function to call. The parameters it consumes will then be used to create the set of locals available inside that function. After popping the function arguments from the stack and incrementing the instruction pointer, the call function operation can now pop the function reference itself and use the value to update the instruction pointer to the first address in that function, while storing the previous instruction pointer value to the stack so we know where to return later. Now we're executing from inside the square function. First thing we do is load x onto the stack. And because we're multiplying x by itself, we'll load x onto the stack a second time. Now we can actually multiply the two values together, and this will pop both sides of the multiplication from the stack, do the actual multiplication, in this case, 4 times 4, and store the resulting value back onto the stack. Now we have our result, and we're ready to return it to the caller. The return value operation will pop the result from the stack. Then it will restore the instruction pointer with the next value on the stack, and then push the actual result back onto the stack again. Now we're back in our main function where we left off, but with the result of the square function left at the top of the stack. We can now store that value into the local variable x. And then the next line of code is to print the value of x. So we'll start by pushing a reference to the print function, and then we'll push a reference to x on back onto the stack. Now we execute the call function operation again, and once again with one uh, parameter of one because there's only one argument. This will consume the reference to x and put it in the local scope for print. Then again, it will pop the function reference, update the instruction pointer, and uh, keep a bookmark on the stack uh, for when it returns. Now, because the print function is implemented in C code, uh, there's no bytecode that we can follow. 
It will essentially execute outside the normal virtual machine, but results will still be placed on the stack when it returns. And because this is the print function, its return value is none. As it returns, the instruction pointer is again restored to where we left off. Because we aren't assigning the value to anything, the next instruction just pops the value from the stack and discards it. Now that the main function is completed, we can get ready to return the implicit none value. That constant value gets pushed back onto the stack. It's a bit ironic since we just popped none off the stack, but at bytecode compi compile time, there was no way to necessarily know this or expect to be able to reuse the value. Finally, we can return control to whatever instruction is on the stack underneath our return value, and the main function will be completed. Now, in reality, our stack isn't just a handful of values, but potentially hundreds or thousands of items, depending on how deep the call stack goes and how complicated the function signatures get. And any meaningfully complex functions can easily contain dozens or hundreds of instructions. Entire applications or services are likely to cross 100,000 instructions and have enormous stacks. And the CPython runtime has to keep track of everything. <laughs> I think that's enough bytecode for one weekend, though. So let's talk about concurrency. It's a simple idea, but often gets conflated with other concepts. At the most basic level, concurrency is about executing multiple tasks. A task could be pretty much anything, but we'll represent it here with this bar. And imagine that we move from left to right as we execute the task. But no one ever has just one task to execute. We'll have multiple tasks that we need to complete, often orders of magnitude more tasks. The naive solution is to just process them in order. When one is finished, we start the next. If we have four tasks, it takes four times as long as one task in order to finish them all. This is easy, this makes sense, and it's fine for normal computation. But this is not what concurrency looks like. For many real-world tasks, they also don't look like homogeneous blocks of computation. They'll look more like this, with big chunks of idle time spent waiting for something, like fetching data from disk or making a network request. If we apply our naive method from before, and execute them sequentially, we spend a lot of time idle, and it still takes us four times as long as a single task. Instead, if we can fully utilize the idle moments to begin executing other tasks, we can finish all four tasks in much less time. The more time we spend idle on any individual task, the more tasks we can overlap to save time. This is the core principle and the goal of concurrency. Now, there are a few different strategies for achieving concurrency. The obvious approach is to just have multiple workers. Each worker could process one task at a time. One way to implement that is with multiprocessing, where each worker is its own process. This means that each worker has its own CPython runtime, its own stack, its own heap, and its own set of compiled bytecode. If we want to process more tasks at once, we simply add more workers. But there are some costs associated with this, of course. First and foremost is the duplicated memory used for each runtime. The second is that any communication between processes has to happen by serializing and deserializing data, adding extra work for each task. On the plus side, this means that each worker is able to process the task in parallel, giving us higher potential utilization of multiple cores. This is called parallelism and is the younger, more popular sibling to concurrency. But while the overall throughput generally scales with the number of workers, each worker, and therefore each process, is still idle while a task is waiting on resources. So another alternative is to use threads for each worker rather than processes. With one worker, we start from the same point as when using processes. But this time, as we add more workers, we only need to add a new, a new call stack for each thread, reducing the duplication of the heap and the bytecode. This also eliminates the need for serializing data between workers, because now they all share the same pool of memory. But as always, this option has its own costs and benefit. I'm sorry, costs and trade-offs. Due to the unique way that CPython was designed with our good friend Gil, we can't run multiple threads of Python code at the same time. So all other threads have to sit idle and wait their turn while the current thread is executing. On top of this, the runtime is in charge of scheduling threads, 
with no insight into what they're doing. And every time a new thread is selected, we have to wait for a costly context switch, which involves saving the execution sta stack of the previous thread and restoring state for the new one. This is what's known as preemptive multitasking. It guarantees fair access to the CPU, and it does make it easier to fully utilize an individual CPU core with multiple threads. But we're more likely to switch threads at the wrong time, resulting in suboptimal behavior, like delaying the start of network requests. This can dramatically increase the amount of time an individual task may take, like the top task that takes twice as long as it should to complete. This might be a worst case example here, but more threads means more context switching, increasing the chance that your tasks will be interrupted at cr critical times. So both multiprocessing and threading have different advantages and disadvantages, but neither of them begin to approach this ideal form of concurrency that I showed earlier. What we really want is a system where tasks can run through their critical phases and only switch to the next task once they are waiting on external re resources. This is called cooperative multitasking, and it's a simple and inexpensive form of concurrency. The trade-off is that it depends on each task being well-mannered and cooperating with all other tasks to share CPU time and any shared resources. But in an application where we control everything, it can result in major wins. In practice, this means that each task needs to either complete or explicitly yield control before another task can execute. The obvious points to yield control is when the task is waiting on external resources, because there's nothing that the task could be doing otherwise. Once we get this level of control from our task, we can schedule them more optimally. We can make better use of our resources and run all our tasks in one thread in one process. So we only have one shared stack of calls and one shared heap. So if we think about how to build these cooperative tasks, we can come across some simple solutions. One might be that we build tasks that follow a simple pattern, make progress when possible, yield when it's not, and eventually complete and return a value. If we wanted to implement this in some naive Python, we might start with something like this. We just execute the run method repeatedly and expect that eventually it will return or yield when it's most convenient for the individual task. And at some point, it will set the ready attribute to true. At that point, we can check the result for the final value. For something even more useless on its own, we can implement a sleep task. Given a duration and a final value, every time we run this task, it'll check the time. Once enough time has, has passed, it marks itself as ready, indicating that the re result is available. But a task on its own isn't useful. We want something that will execute many tasks concurrently. What we want is an event loop. We'll use this as our framework for running our tasks. It takes a list of task objects and repeatedly calls the run method on pending tasks. As each task marks itself ready, the event loop will eventually be running fewer tasks in each iteration. Once all of the tasks have completed, it returns a list of the final results. Now, if we create a number of tasks, in this case, ones that sleep for a random amount of time, we can then run our event loop on these tasks. All 10 tasks will get run to completion by the event loop, and results will come back after the longest task has finally finished. And if we give it 1,000 of these tasks, even this naive event loop is still able to complete them in less time than it might have taken to spawn, run, and compile the results from 1,000 threads or 1,000 processes. But this task implementation is lacking at best. Each task has to manually keep track of its progress, and each task has to design its run method to start from the beginning every time. Our framework also doesn't make it easy for tasks to call other functions that may also need to wait on their own resources. If only there was a way to write some code that could yield multiple values over time and be able to start executing from where they previously left off. Some of you may already see where this is heading, but generators fit this description perfectly. Let's look at how they work. The Fibonacci sequence is a staple of generator examples, and it's conceptually simple. Each time th through the loop, we add the previous two numbers together and yield that value, resulting in the sequence 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, and so on. But when we call this function, we don't get any of these values directly. 
Instead, we actually get a generator object. This is a compiled version of our generator function. The actual code in our function hasn't even started executing yet. The generator object can then be iterated over just like a list. And the standard next function from the standard library can be used to iterate just once at a time. Each time we call next on our generator object, it's re-entering the function where it left off, preserving the full state. And if the function yields another value, we get that value as the result or return value of the next call. When the generator function completes or returns, the generator object raises a stop iteration uh, value, just like any other iterator would when you reach the end of it. Now, it's quite common to see generators that yield values out, but it's also possible to communicate or send values back into the generator from the outside. When this happens, after returning execution to the generator function, the yield statement itself gives the value that was sent into the generator. To do this, we have to replace the use of the next function with the generator's send method. This will execute the function from where it left off, and just like next, it will, it will return any yielded values from the generator. Until the function has actually been started, though, we can only send none. After that, we can keep sending and receiving values until the generator completes. And congratulations, now you've just discovered coroutines. And Python's had them hiding in plain sight for years. But how do we actually use this to run concurrent tasks? Well, as it turns out, we can adapt our event loop from earlier to make, and make it better in the process. Instead of calling a run method on each task, we're calling the send method on each generator object. And rather than looking for a flag, we catch the stop iteration error and mark those uh, generators or tasks as completed. Starting in Python 3.3, stop iteration itself contains the return value from these generators. So we save those for the final result. Lastly, we also capture intermediate yielded values and send them back on the next iteration, which enables coroutines to call other coroutines. This means that we can now yield from another coroutine to call into it, and our position in the stack of coroutine calls will be preserved across yields. Together, this makes our use of coroutines look and feel more like standard functions. But they're still yielding control on their terms and get to continue uh, where they left off when it's their turn again. So if we create a pair of coroutines from our foo function and pass them to our event loop, it will follow execution through foo into bar, then into the sleep coroutine. In there, it will continue yielding back to the event loop until the time duration is up. Then on the next iteration through, it will return control to bar, which returns the value back to foo, which finally completes and returns the value. And to be clear, at each yield, our event loop is cycling to the next pending task, giving us the cooperative multitasking concurrency that we've been looking for. Now let's do something a bit more useful, like fetch content from a bunch of URLs. We can write a fetch coroutine, which initiates the connection for a single URL, and a read coroutine that buffers data from that connection as it becomes available. By having the read coroutine yield after every chunk is read, this allows other tasks the opportunity to execute while waiting on more data. We can then call fetch a bunch of times to create the generator coroutines. Our event loop will start each one and run them concurrently until all the requests are completed. We then have the raw response data for each request, and we can do with it as we please. Congratulations again, you just invented AsyncIO. Uh, what we have, though, is actually just a very primitive version of AsyncIO using the same syntax that was available in Python 3.4, but we have absolutely no bells or whistles yet. Now, this example code was informative and fun to play with, but it isn't very flexible, and it won't help us if we use it with libraries that aren't designed for it. So please, do not use this in production. Uh, there's a reason it's not on PyPI. So now that we've seen how we can build coroutines up from various features in Python, let's take a look at how Python has built first-class support for coroutines directly into the language and the standard library. Starting with 3.5, Python now supports the async def syntax for declaring native coroutines. Like our toy generator coroutines before, this is no longer a standard function that executes immediately when called. Instead, 
calling this will return a coroutine object, which can then be run on an event loop. This event loop is provided by the async IO framework, among others, and it executes tasks in round-robin order, just like our wait function from before. Here, we use the new helper from 3.7 that will create an event loop, execute our coroutine, then close the event loop when the coroutine is completed. So let's do just that. We call the foo coroutine function, print that object out, then run the coroutine on the event loop, and get and print the result when it's finished. We can see the coroutine object itself we got from calling foo, and it only starts executing once we pass it to asyncio.run. Inside coroutines, we now also have a new power available, available to us, the ability to await objects. This is similar to our use of yield from earlier in, in, I'm sorry, in the generator coroutines earlier, but it's even better. We're using asyncio.sleep here in the example, which serves the same purpose as our sleep generator earlier. This provides a simple way to yield control of the event loop when passing delay equals zero. But we can do more than just await other coroutines. We can await a large variety of asynchronous objects, including awaitables and futures. This flexibility makes it easier to bridge old style synchronous libraries with async code bases, and also provides us with more expressive forms for building concurrency into our applications. So if we take our coroutine from before, we can call and await the sleepy coroutine. Sleepy itself can do something, await other things, and eventually return a value. This value is then returned as a result of the await keyword in foo, and can be used or assigned as usual. One of the common workflows in concurrent programming is to create multiple subtasks. If we just use the await keyword directly on each task, one after another, we don't get concurrency from that. Instead, if we want to await multiple things at the same time and actually run them concurrently, we, we need to use the asyncio.gather helper. This takes a number of futures, coroutines, or awaitables, promotes them to tasks, and runs them concurrently, and eventually returns the results in the same order it was given. This is the direct async IO equivalent of our wait function earlier. We also have language support for asynchronous iterables and context managers. Async iterables are just like standard ones, but use coroutines for fetching the next item. Similarly, async context managers use coroutines instead of normal functions when entering and exiting the context. Lastly, we have support for asynchronous generators. These build on top of generators and coroutines to give us, you guessed it, more generators. These are de facto async iterables, though, which makes them fantastically useful for building expressive async interfaces without sacrificing on readability or maintainability. So let's put this all together into one final demo and build an async I.O. version of URL fetching. Here, we implement fetching a single URL using the AIO HTTP library. Calling request gives us an async context, which does the connection and gives us a response object. We can then await the text method of that to wait for and receive the full body of the response. From our main coroutine, we can then call fetch for each URL giving us a list of coroutine objects. We can then pass those to asyncio.gather, which will execute each one as a concurrent task. Then we can take the results from awaiting the gather and print the responses to the console. When we run this with asyncio.run, we can see that the results match the results we got earlier with our generator coroutine and custom event loop. Cooperative multitasking has been in use for many decades. It was even a core feature of early versions of macOS and Windows. Coroutines have been an evolving feature of the Python language for well over a decade. Async.io as a framework has been around in one form or another for over six years. None of this is magic. Everything we see is the result of iterative design and development, building on top of previous features or abstractions, always learning from previous lessons. It just takes a bit of curiosity to peel back the onion, decipher the motivations, and understand how and why each decision was made and how they influence the future. We stand on the shoulders of giants. If you enjoyed any part of this talk, you will like these peps. They are surprisingly readable. <laughs> and even if you're already familiar with coroutines or async IO, I bet you'll learn something that will help you or influence the decisions you make in the future. 
maybe next time you see someone working with AsyncIO, you can finally say, it's a coroutine, I know this. <laughs> and if you want to play with any of the example code, uh, they're all available on my GitHub repository here. And feel free to catch me outside. Uh, happy to answer any other questions or dig any deeper on any of these topics. Thank you. Thanks, John.